All right, Krim 1, chapter 1. Here we go. Okay, so let's start with chapter 1. Um, what is the criminal justice system? So, here we go. I'm not sure. Okay, here we go. Um, wow, we're going super basic here. Um, laws. What is crime? What is behavior? What is normal? What is deviant? Okay, so we, as part of society, basically, without even really thinking about it, we agree to abide by certain rules and norms just to be part of normal society. Okay, so just just think about it like if we were sitting all sitting together in a classroom right now uh, we're not so but but imagine we are would it be reasonable or normal to like let out a big loud fart mm, yeah probably not now you're all sitting at home probably in your, the privacy of your own home it's probably okay to do that there, if that's what you feel comfortable with, depending on who's around you. There are norms and behaviors that are acceptable uh, in a civilized society. And we, as part of civilized society, have decided, generally speaking, as a whole, that in order to be part of a civilized society, we are going to kind of go along with the norms, um, in order to more or less be a part of a civilized, normal society. There are deviants or violations of the norm. You know, the person who decides to rip a big fart in class or pick their nose in the middle of class or whatever. Now, these are obviously kind of social uh, norms and deviances from the norms, but in general, um, there are norms and um, kind of violations of norms. Um, and then again, particular acts are considered deviant depending on the context, place, time, and the individual who's judging it. Okay, so you are sitting at home and you're comfortable with your spouse, your significant other, your mom, your dad, whatever. So if, if I'm sitting at home um, and my husband's there and he decides to rip a big fart um, and he's with his wife. Uh, I'm horrified, by the way. Um, that's disgusting to me. But <laughs> it would be much different than if he were at a business meeting and he did that, right? It depends on the context, the place, time, and the individual judging it. So there are some norms and laws. And I know, are we, is this criminal behavior? No. But it's a start to what we're going to talk about. So social norms, rules and, uh, that specify how people are expected to behave, right? We have, there are expectations. Um, many of these are informal, like you know that it's proper to wait in line in order to, you know, like if you're at the grocery store, you don't just walk right up to the cash register. You wait your turn. Um, Formal social norms are formally written. Those are more, and, and when something is formally written, these might be things like laws, right? So these are more legal. So if something is a formal norm, that uh, we're getting more into something um, that would be something that might be addressed in the criminal justice system. Violations of those norms written formal norms might be things that are addressed in the criminal justice system. Okay, so let me also start with, in order for something to be a crime, it has to be written somewhere. It's uh, criminal behavior is not criminal behavior if it's not written. It's not a crime if it's not written. So if there's no punishment, if there's no written law, then it's not against the law. I know, and that seems kind of crazy if you think about it, but 
all those huge, super thick uh, criminal law books that, that you uh, have probably seen. Uh, generally speaking, they're called the, the penal code. Um, those generally will include every single type of um, law that exists. Oh, great, the lawnmower is going by. Um, I'm actually on campus right now, and the lawnmower is going by outside. Sorry. All right. Mala in se. Let me make sure. Okay, there we go. Mala in se is one type of crime. Mala in se is a law that is considered morally wrong. So, let me um, give an example of something that would be morally wrong. An act that is mala in se would be something like raping someone's grandma, raping a child. Doing something horrific like that would be in most instances considered morally wrong and just plain horrific. Okay? Mala and say, it's bad in and of itself. The act in and of itself is morally wrong. Okay. Mala prohibita. Mala prohibita is a kind of law that is mad, uh, not mad, it is bad because we say it's bad. We, as a society, have decided that this behavior is bad. It's not morally bad, it's not inherently bad, but it's bad because we say it's bad. Things like taking drugs. Is it really inherently bad to swallow a pill? I mean, really, is it inherently bad to do so? Not necessarily, but we as a society have decided that certain things, certain behaviors are bad because we say they're bad. So we have prohibited them. So um, there's, we, we categorize these in mala and say, bad in and of themselves, inherently bad or morally bad and mala prohibita. It's bad because we as a society have gotten together and decided, eh, we think that this should be wrong. So we're deciding to say that it is wrong. Okay like this, Mar marijuana. And, and these things change throughout time. Um, you know, 10 years ago in California, marijuana was illegal. You could not smoke marijuana. Uh, you would get arrested for it. Now, um, if you are over 21, you can uh, recreationally use marijuana. Oops, so these things do change. Sanctions, so these are consequences for the illegal behavior. These consequences can be formal or informal. And um, typically, the consequences for the behavior are designed to get people to not engage in that behavior again. Make sense? I hope so. I'm just talking to myself now. Uh, victims. Uh, victims are impacted uh, in mo uh, during most uh, criminal behavior. Um, more often, criminals and their victims are, this is really interesting, um, if you think about it, a lot of people will think, oh, a victim of crime, that a little old woman is probably most likely going to be the victim of crime. That is so not true. Um, little old women are probably the least likely to be victimized. Um, the most likely uh, person in the United States to be a victim of crime is going to be a young black male. But uh, more often, criminals and their victims are the same race, age range, live in the same neighborhood, have the same socioeconomic status, and are the same gender with the exception of rape. and victims are neglected and abused by the criminal justice system at times. And this is true. Uh, I worked as a probation officer, uh, as I've mentioned for you know, about 20 years. And um, I was so busy working, trying to control my uh, probationers that a lot of times the victims were the last thing I was worried about. And um, I hate to say that, but it was true, uh, sad but true. 
um, there have been victims' rights movements, and um, more focus has been uh, placed on victims. Criminal justice system is broken down into law enforcement, the courts, and corrections. So those three yellow boxes in the middle are basically what this class is gonna be broken up into, three components. I might ask that on a quiz. Law enforcement, the courts, and corrections. Law enforcement is the most familiar part of the criminal justice system because that's what we see. If you think about you know, any given day, how many police officers did you see on your way to work this morning or school? Um, I saw probably at least three, four on my way to Fresno City College this morning and probably be another three or four on campus this morning. They are expected to resolve many of society's problems um, and entrusted to use force only when necessary. <clears throat> there are a lot uh, now of police officers um, moved into education settings and community-based initiatives. Uh, as you're probably aware, there are police officers um, on many school campuses. There certainly are here at Fresno City College. Most, uh, well, all of the Fresno high schools uh, have uh, police officers on campus. Most, if not all, of the Fre uh, Clovis Unified campuses have them, Central, Sanger, um, I think Selma has one, um, but most of the most of the big schools uh, have uh, police officers on campuses as well. Um, as you're aware, uh, law enforcement responsibles are ultimately responsible for upholding the law and protecting the community. Um, here's a picture of a school resource, it's a really blurry picture, but a school resource officer reading to elementary school students. And we're going to go in depth about law enforcement, the courts and corrections. So we're just going to touch really quick. The courts um, in the United States is a dual court system. We have state courts and we have federal courts. The state courts are the, uh, the vast majority of your random street crime, which occurs in the city of Fresno is going to go to the state courts, which are here uh, in downtown Fresno. The, Courts, is it on Fresno or Tulare Street? It might, I don't know. The big courthouse <laughs> downtown Fresno. Um, your general, uh, your, your murders, your carjackings, your vehicle theft, your most of your cases are going to be heard in the state courts. Um, there are appellate courts um, for the uh, state court systems as well. There are also Supreme Courts in the state court system as well. We also have federal courts and we have some in downtown Fresno. There is an actual federal court in downtown Fresno. They hear federal cases. I know, that's crazy, huh? Uh, if I ask you a question on your quiz, like what kind of cases are heard in federal courts, don't overthink it. I'm just looking for the answer, federal cases. What's a federal case? Well, typically, it's um, a case where a federal crime was committed, and federal crimes typically have to do with federal agencies or crimes where um, crimes that have been committed across state lines. Things like drug trafficking across state lines, things like uh, human trafficking across state lines. Uh, meaning, you know, if you're you're uh, human trafficking and you're taking your girls between um, Nevada and California, or if you're trafficking drugs between Arizona and California, or if you rob a bank um, that is insured by the federal government, so that is a federal crime. So there are different levels of federal courts as well, appellate and supreme courts as well. Uh, in the judicial process, this is a court process. The prosecutor decides whether or not to prosecute a case and again we're just we're just lightly touching on this stuff uh, in this chapter a grand jury decides that that case should go to trial they will decide if there's enough evidence to go forward a defense attorney will protect the legal rights of the defendant and a judge will ensure the rules of evidence and the laws are not violated 
And finally, my favorite, corrections. I did not think that corrections would have ever been my favorite, but as a probation officer, this is what um, kind of my area was. Systematic, organized effort by society to punish offenders, protect the public, and change an offender's behavior. Whew, that's the goal. Um, I can't say that, that corrections is always super effective, but that is certainly the goal. Once convicted, an offender may be imprisoned or given an alternative sentence. Um, yeah, they could go to prison or they could get probation. And we're going to talk again at length about all this stuff. So I'm, I know it sounds like a lot of information right now, but we're going to talk at length about all this stuff later. Probation or parole. Pro this is going to be a pet peeve of mine. So um, this is something I would certainly know the difference between probation and parole. Probation is when a judge sentences an offender to... Um, basically reside in the community under court supervision. Parole is when a parole board grants an early release for an offender from prison. Very different. If you're on parole, you've been to prison and the parole board decided to let you out early. If you're on probation, you were sentenced by a judge and you never made your way to prison. Again, we're gonna talk more at length, but again, touching on these. Victim services, um, this book focuses a lot on victim services and um, I would love to spend as much time as possible on victim services, but uh, it's not part of our student learning outcomes for this course. And um, so I do have to kind of rush through it a little bit. I, and I know that so, I know at least one of you wanted to be a victim advocate. So I'm, there's a ton of information in the book about it, which is really good. Victim services are a, an invaluable tool. Um, victims really, really, really get the short end of the stick in a lot of the criminal justice system. But victim services, uh, we have victim advocates that work for the probation department and they help the victims uh, immensely to get through the court process. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they don't make very much money. That is frustrating. Victim impact statements are something that are um, uh, very, can be very significant in the court process. Victims typically um, are allowed to make a statement to the court uh, at sentencing. So um, these are something new things actually that the victims um, are allowed to do. So uh, when an offender is uh, sentenced, the victims typically have the opportunity to make a statement. <laughs> Technology uh, is something that has also uh, definitely changed the criminal justice system and it continues to change the criminal justice system. Uh, you probably all get those crazy alerts on your phone that scare you to death when they go off, but they're amazing and have helped save uh, probably hundreds of, of um, people. Working in the criminal justice system. Oh, good Lord, this is long. Um, so the criminal justice system does not have the, case, the capacity to take every case to trial. Oh my goodness, not by a, a long shot. So um, if you think of um, like a funnel or like a, um, a triangle, an inverted triangle. Sorry, I had to take a drink of coffee really quick. Whew. Um, is there a picture of this? Oh, there we go. Um, You'll see down here, I think you can see my, so many people get arrested, so many crimes are committed, and so very few actually get prosecuted and incarcerated. So many start up here, and so very few actually go. Um, the criminal justice system is um, basically a giant funnel. Um, a lot of cases are dropped, handled informally, uh, dismissed, all kinds of other things happen before people actually get sentenced, convicted, and or actually incarcerated.
we think that there's all kinds of these wild, crazy cases that occur where people get murdered or horrific things happen, but honestly, there are very few of those. There's a lot of these crazy, of these uh, general um, misdemeanor cases that occur. So we see um, there are layers, as we call the wedding cake model. A lot of, of low-level misdemeanors, very few of these crazy um, cases like O.J. Simpson. You know, a lot of people would think, oh my gosh, there's so many of these insane domestic violence cases that happen where people get murdered. Really, there aren't that many, but we hear, those are the ones we hear about. We don't hear about all these misdemeanors of people's catalytic converters getting stolen out of their cars. But there's tons of these. Uh, how do you prevent crime? Um, that's a really good question. Somebody in Fresno needs to take that up. <laughs> We've got a lot of crime in Fresno. Uh, but there are uh, a lot of measures that can be and are being taken to prevent crime. Uh, Fresno is a great example. We used to be number one in vehicle theft. Uh, and we are no longer number one in vehicle theft. Um, partially, there's a lot of reasons for that, but partially probably because the Fresno Police Department um, and a bunch of other agencies uh, in the Fresno area, uh, California Highway Patrol, Fresno County Probation, the CHP, um, the Fresno County DA's Office, Fresno County Sheriff's Department, a bunch of agencies got together and uh, started what they call the HEAT Team, Help Eliminate Auto Theft. Um, and um, then Fresno PD also has a CCAT, Career Criminal Auto Theft. So there's a bunch of different task forces task forces, task force, anyways, that um, specifically work on reducing vehicle theft. Um, with those task forces, <laughs> why is that hard for me to say? Anyways, they uh, have been able to reduce um, crimes. <sighs> okay, where are we, crime prevention? Crime control model, ultimately. You have a couple of different ideas or um, theories on, on how crime should be handled. The crime control model is basically a concept of lock them up. Lock criminals up and you will control crime. Lock them up. Who cares about their rights? Who cares about anything else? Lock offenders up. Okay, you have plenty. You can pause all this if you want to read. The due process model is much more the other side. Protect their rights at all costs. We need to protect the offender's rights at all costs. What influences the criminal justice system? And I will tell you that all of this stuff influences the criminal justice system. Our fear of crime, we citizens, our fear, our fear of crime, that will um, impact how we vote, how we vote, who's in charge, uh, how uh, how much pressure we put on our um, police agencies, on our politicians, things like that. <clears throat> if we're afraid to go out in the community, we're going to uh, put pressure on our leaders to make sure that we're no longer afraid. Media coverage, oh, absolutely. Media um, definitely can shape how we see um, our law enforcement, our crime rates, um, all kinds of things. Politics, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And discrimination, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, discrimination is a horrific still a horrific problem in our criminal justice system. <laughs> um, would you want to walk into a storefront that looked like this? Because I wouldn't. I'd walk right past that. Does media, can, can the media inflate public fear of crime? Of course they can. Do they? Yes, they do sometimes. They focus on violent crime and portray the culprits as minorities. Do they do this sometimes? They do this sometimes, yes. Politics, do politicians 
play uh, into, um, let me kind of explain here. If politicians want to get reelected, they need to make their community happy. And they're going to do whatever they can to make sure that the community votes them back into power. Sometimes that means um, changing their police tactics. Individuals in jail or prison or on probation are disproportionately people of color. This is 100% true. It, ha it continues to be true. Racial disparities in the criminal justice system are seen as an extension of social divisions in U.S. society. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Drug laws, uh, there was a huge problem with uh, discrimination in drug laws. Uh, crack cocaine and powdered cocaine, although made from the same, uh, the same drug, uh, had very different uh, sentences. If you were caught with crack cocaine versus being caught with powdered cocaine, uh, the sentences for both of those were very different. Crack cocaine is something that you saw a lot in very poor black communities. Powdered cocaine is something that you saw in wealthy white communities. Um, it was the, the, the disparity was ridiculous and I think they finally did change some of those laws. So challenges to the criminal justice system today, cybercrime, terrorism, technology, um, Trying to keep up with technology is something that's been very challenging. Um, appropriate mix of technology and jurisdiction, public safety, and I mean, just every single day, uh, there are new challenges. Um, and I would argue that now um, our society and um, the view of police community relations is also violating victims' rights, increasing rates of imprisonment, which is actually going down again now. Um, there's so many things, so many challenges. Um, we got a lot to talk about, guys. I know this is a really long chapter. They won't all, I hope they won't all be this long, but we made it.